Good morning, and welcome to the GMB for the Trinity Monday Discourse. This is our second Trinity Monday to be delivered virtually, rather than to the usual crowds. Earlier this morning, I read out the names of the new fellows and scholars, and my congratulations to all of them. We can't have the traditional scholars' dinner tonight, but every decade, the scholars of the decade are invited back for the dinner, which means that in 2031, 30, uh, these 2021 scholars will be back in college to celebrate their achievement, together with the 2011, 2001, and 1991 scholars, and so on, back through the decades. Trinity Monday is perhaps the most quintessential of all our college festive days. It's a day steeped in Trinity heritage, a day when we renew our tradition through our new scholars and fellows, and a day when we reflect on our tradition through the Trinity Monday discourse, in which a distinguished graduate is asked to speak on another distinguished graduate. The discourse has been one of the highlights of my time as provost. I recall many brilliant lectures. This, my last discourse as provost, is a particularly special occasion. The Taunishta, Leo Varadkar is giving the discourse on Noel Brown. What makes the discourse special is that a preeminent politician and Trinity Medical graduate is delivering the discourse on another preeminent politician and Trinity Medical graduate, and he's doing so during a pandemic. As Minister for Health in the late 1940s, Noel Brown brought in mass screening for tuberculosis and launched a large-scale construction programme to build new hospitals and sanatoria. I'm sure I'm not the first to wonder what he would have made of the current health crisis. We're most grateful to the Taunishta for accepting our invitation and bringing his unique perspective on the life and achievement of Noel Brown. In Trinity, we're very proud of Leo Varadkar, the first of our graduates to become Taoiseach. He graduated with his medical degree in 2003 and has been a continually engaged alumnus, giving so much support to our college activities. I recall him as Minister for Health in 2014, coming into the college to take the ice bucket challenge and getting thoroughly drenched and frozen in order to raise money to support research into motor neuron disease. It's characteristic of his generosity that he's taking the time to deliver this lecture today. We're sorry that we can't have a large in-person audience, but I believe it's the largest global audience that we've had, because it's online, the largest global audience for a Trinity Monday Memorial Discourse. The Taunishta was an active member of the HIST when he was a student here, and his speeches as a politician are noted for their wide-ranging exploration of history, culture, literature, and science. Noel Brown, who had himself such a wide-ranging career and interests, is a wonderful subject for the Taunishta. Trinity is fortunate to hold the Noel Brown archive presented to us by his wife, uh, Phyllis Brown. There are, I think, 40 boxes in the archive, as well as the expected material on, for instance, the mother and child scheme, there are boxes on the anti-apartheid movement, on gay rights, prisoners' rights, El Salvador, the Gael Tocht, which is to say, of course, that a discourse on Noel Brown could go in many different directions. Without further ado, may I invite Umthanishta, TD for Dublin West, Leo Varadkar, to deliver the 2021 Trinity Monday Memorial Discourse. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Pravis, for the uh, very kind um, invitation and the deep honor uh, of having the opportunity to uh, give this discourse. Um, Provost, fellows, scholars of Trinity College, ladies and gentlemen, on Monday, the 16th of May, 1994, Trinity Monday, the 78-year-old Noel Brown was made an honorary fellow of Trinity College Dublin. It was the greatest public honour of his long and often controversial career in public life. 
and it was one that he treasured enormously. As Professor Tom O'Dowd of the School of Medicine recalled after his death, he sometimes even signed his letters Noel Brown FTCD. In the Irish Times, the day after the announcement, there's a photograph of a jubilant Noel Brown hearing the news, and his happiness is unmistakable. He can also be seen in the traditional photograph of the new scholars and fellows taking his place alongside the provost, Dr. Thomas Mitchell, and new fellows such as David Singleton and the late historian, Helga Robinson Hammerstein. Trinity meant a lot to Noel Brown. It educated him and trained him to be a doctor. It's where he met his beloved wife, Phyllis, and it's the constituency that elected him to Shannon Aaron. It was the place that honored him so publicly when he was otherwise forgotten and ignored. And when Trinity's autonomy and governance came into question in the 1990s, he rushed into print to condemn the proposed universities legislation. The Irish Times in 1996, or rather in the Irish Times in 1996, he described Trinity as part of our internationally accepted precious heritage and a brilliant jewel in the crown of Irish enlightenment, culture and academic distinction. Praising Trinity's centuries old and precious autonomy, his conclusion was the demand that once again, Trinity must survive. After his death in 1997, his papers were gifted to Trinity by his widow Phyllis, and they contain 37 boxes of manuscripts with draft speeches and articles, as well as early versions of his memoir, Against the Tide. Speaking in the long room at a public exhibition based around these papers in 1999, Phyllis Brown said that it was a miracle that there was anything to donate, revealing that her husband was, and I quote, terribly untidy, never knew where anything was. I spent half my life looking for things for him, she said. The collection also included letters from members of the public, which he retained. One letter was from someone who believed that he owed his life to the work of Brown and the work he'd done as Minister for Health. And it gives a good insight into the incredible loyalty that many felt towards him. The letter writer revealed, it often makes me angry what our countrymen did to you, after all that you did for our country. I think to best understand Brown and the forces which drove him throughout his life, you have to understand the tragic circumstances of his early life and the determination it gave him to fight against prejudice and poverty and injustice. He spoke about all of this in 1994, when he unveiled a plaque in Hollyman, County Mayo, the village where his mother had been born. In 1927, his mother, Mary Teresa Brown, contracted TB shortly after the death of her husband. Knowing that she was dying, she decided to travel to England because she was terrified about what, what might happen to her orphaned children if she stayed in Ireland. As Noel recounted, it would have meant for myself, the horror of Letterfrack's notorious industrial school. For the girls, the great love-starved warehouses of unwanted children. Shortly after arriving in London, Noel's mother died, and as they had no money, she's buried in a pauper's grave. As he described it, no grave, no headstone, no funeral, a non-person. As was often the case in those days, the family was shattered and scattered. A sister Eileen died in a hospital in Italy on her own. His disabled brother Jody died in a workhouse. A sister Una went to America. Nula Fuelon, who was at the unveiling of the plaque, wrote that the story would move a stone. And she wondered at the fact that Noel was able to tell it at all without weeping. At the end of the, of the event, Noel Brown concluded by saying, perhaps you may now better understand the lifelong dedication of my wife Phyllis and myself to the cause of oppressed womanhood in the Irish Republic. Afterwards, people crowded around the street, like after a funeral. One woman remarked that every word out of that man's mouth today was the truth. God love him. He's not over it yet. It's an honour for me as a graduate of Trinity and a former Minister for Health to be invited by the Provost to speak about Dr Noel Brown today 
and to deliver the final Trinity Mon Monday discourse of his provostship. I want to congratulate him on his term of office and also congratulate his successor, Professor Linda Doyle, and to wish her the very best in the role. I'm deeply sorry that today's event is a different kind of one because of COVID-19. A fight to save lives that Noel Brown would have understood very well. Today, Trinity has played a leading role in the fight against COVID-19, in the hospitals, the GP clinics and laboratories, and also on the airwaves, explaining the science behind everything. And I want to thank your students and staff for all that they have done as part of the national effort in the past 14 months. Back in 2015, when I spoke at Connolly Hospital in Blanchestown as part of the 60th anniversary celebrations, I paid tribute to Noel Brown's work as minister and called him a true idealist. Some people I think were surprised. Noel Brown was a member of five different political parties over the course of his career, but never Fine Gael. And we would certainly have differed strongly on some issues. However, I've always admired his idealism, his passion and his determination to stand up for causes and the people he believed in. Today is an opportunity to explore this remarkable contribution to Irish life in a respectful but not uncritical way and to assess his legacy. The legacy, of course, includes his influence over other politicians. As Taoiseach, I enjoyed regular visits to Ars Anuchtaran for Article 28 conversations with the President. In his study, President Higgins has a portrait of Noel Brown as a young man, painted by Sean Keating, and he calls it his favourite possession. The young Michael D saw the painting in Kenny's bookshop in Galway, and he had to buy it. He paid for it in instalments, starting with his first paycheck. In it, Brown is wearing a bow tie and gloves resting on his knees. Some people have interpreted that as Brown throwing down the gauntlet to the Catholic Church. However, President Higgins sees the painting as something a little bit more realistic and a lot more human. He knew Brown very well. Brown was his mentor and his friend, and he remembers that Brown drove a sports car, and these were, in fact, his driving gloves. Born on the 20th of December 1915 in Waterford, Noel Brown was the fourth of eight children. His early years were spent in Derry, where he contracted measles and became deaf in one ear, a disability he hid from all but his closest friends and family. His excellent biographer, John Horgan, wonders whether this partially contributed to the belief that he was arrogant and aloof, as he sometimes became withdrawn at meetings because he wasn't able to hear everything that was being said. The family next moved to Athlone, where Noel's sister Annie contracted TB and died after only a few weeks. Noel described the tragedy movingly in his memoir, with the apple-sized head of a tormented infant, twisting and turning, uselessly fighting for life-supporting air that wouldn't come. More tragedy was to come later, when both his parents became infected and became terminally ill as well. Riding in against the tide, Brown believed that his father's hard-working conditions had led to the infection in the first place, and that he slowly destroyed himself, working long and late hours. His father died in 1927, when Noel was only 12 years old. Following this, his family moved to Hollymount in County Mayo, as I mentioned, his mother's birthplace. As Horgan recounts, tuberculosis had all the con connotations of the plague. The family was avoided for fear of contamination, and it became an even more lonely and difficult childhood than it might have been. His mother's health was worsening, and the family moved to London where she died, and after that the family was scattered. Until the day he died, Brown was motivated by a sense of injustice at what had befallen his family, and he suffered from a form of survivor's guilt as well, because he had lived while those he had loved had died. Even in later years, he asked himself the nagging questions. Is your life stolen? How can you enjoy a life that isn't really yours? He particularly disliked Christmas and didn't enjoy celebrating it with his family, 
preferring to go sailing on his own instead. Now an orphan, Brown received a scholarship to attend a prestigious Jesuit-run public school Beaumont near Windsor. There he excelled academically and performed well in sports. He took up rugby, cricket and boxing. Brown continued to box when he attended Trinity, but gave it up suddenly after knocking out one of his opponents in one bout. Nevertheless, when he ran for the doll for the first time in 1948, his membership of the TCD Boxing Club was suggested by the editor of the Irish Times as the reason why voters of Dublin South East should elect him. At Beaumont, a classmate remembers his, him being quiet and withdrawn, someone who could be easily aroused to fury by any misplaced humour concerning Ireland or the Irish. There he befriended another young Irish student, Neville Chance, and this changed the course of his life. Neville's father, Sir Arthur Chance, was impressed by Brown and decided to pay for his education, suggesting that he attend Trinity College in Dublin with the family's support. And so in Michaelmas term, 1934, he entered the walls of this university to study medicine. According to many accounts, Noel worked hard and played hard during his time in Trinity. As John Horgan describes it, he lived life to the full, talking through the night, drinking in the back room of the Bailey or in Davy Burns, going to bed at six in the morning and getting up in time to catch a train down the country to play a football match. Some things don't change all that much. He was good looking and he was invited to many parties and he often brought along his own accordion and played for the guests. Although we're told that religion sometimes prevented things going further, Horgan notes that Noel once complained to a fellow student that on a journey home by car after a party, when he'd been at close quarters with a girl in the back seat, his activities had been serially interrupted because she insisted on blessing herself whenever the car passed a church. Of course, Brown's great passion was social justice. And this was evident during his Trinity days. After one party at the Trinity Boat Club, Brown went on for a meal with a fellow student at a local cafe. There he spoke passionately about the plight of the poor and what needed to be done. Eventually, they had to leave because some of the other customers began starting making comments about Trinity students. In 1936, he met Phyllis Hogan at the Trinity Boat Club dance, and it's said that their relationship began after running into each other near the Provost House. When Phyllis died in 2006, she was, prayed for, she was praised for the significant contribution that she had made to Noel's career. And it was also noted that Trinity College had a special place in her life and that the honorary fellowship conferred on Noel in 1994 was a tribute they both treasured to the end of his life. Phyllis did everything from typing his constituency correspondence to on one occasion making a first Holy Communion dress for a child of an impoverished constituent. In 1938, she was diagnosed with TB herself and had to be hospitalized. Noel wrote to her every day until she recovered and was released. In 1939, he himself was diagnosed with the illness and was hospitalized in Dr. Stevens Hospital. And as a result, he missed some of his examinations, but he was awarded enough credit to complete the year. Brown qualified as a doctor in December 1940. His contemporaries considered him to be quiet and reserved and in the middle of his class academically. But one thing that stood out was his lack of respect for anyone in authority. We're told that when he was an intern in Dr. Stevens Hospital, he was once rebuked by the famous Dr. Solomons for wearing a dirty coat and for looking worse than a painter. Brown took one look at Solomon's, still dressed in his hunting pink after the morning out with the Ward Hunt, and responded, and you, sir, look like a broken down jockey in that ridiculous gear. The exchange became part of Trinity folklore. As his tuberculosis became worse, Brown had an extended period of hospitalization in England, once again paid for by the Chance family. He lost two stone in weight and had to have an operation on his right lung but the operation was not a complete success and contributed to his poor health. Upon his release, he became a house physician at a sanatorium in Newcastle and Wicklow before becoming assistant medical officer at the Cheshire Joint Sanatorium. 
Determined to fight the spread of TB and to help those suffering from it, he began work on research which became the basis for his medical doctorate, which he was awarded by Trinity in 1948, for original research into the blood sedimentation rate of TB sufferers. In January 1994, he married Phyllis in a church in Uxbridge near Harefield. It was a Catholic ceremony, even though Phyllis was Church of Ireland, and she refused to sign a pledge to bring up any children as Catholic. At the time, she'd been told by a friendly doctor that Noel had only six months to live. As it turned out, they were happily married for over half a century and had two daughters. President Higgins called the relationship between Phyllis and Noel Brown one of the greatest partnerships in Irish politics, especially on the left. He has said that from their earliest years together, they embraced every progressive and egalitarian issue in Ireland and abroad, be it the establishment of the rights at home and health, housing and education, our, our participation in opposition to apartheid in South Africa. There was no money for, for a honeymoon and deciding to move back to Ireland, Brown returned to his post at the Newcastle Sanatorium. Brown took his first steps into national politics, opposing the Public Health Bill of 1945. He also became friends with Oliver J. Flanagan, who was the independent TD for Leash Offaly at the time, and who he himself suffered TB throughout 1947 and 48. Brown visited him regularly in hospital, and Horgan wonders what, apart from TB, might they have had in common to talk about. Thanks in part to his friendship with Noel Hartnett, another Trinity graduate, Brown joined a new radical political party, Clan Apolicta. He was then selected to run in the Dublin South East constituency in the 1948 general election. The party ran two candidates in a three-seater, and Noel later believed he'd been chosen to be a sweeper to help elect his running mate, Donald, Donald O'Donoghue. However, Brown's, Brown's record at fighting TB was a major plank in the Clan of the campaign, and his ability as a speaker impressed many, and he received 4,917 first preferences and was elected on the fifth count after John A. Costello for Fine Gael and Sean McEntee for Fianna Fáil. We know after the election, 16 years of Fianna Fáil government came to an end with the creation of the first inter-party government with the National Executive of Clan of Pugleta agreeing narrowly by two votes to join Ireland's first coalition. The party was allocated two seats of cabinet, and McBride surprised many by offering Brown the Department of Health, a department that had only been created a year before. And so at the young age of 32, Brown became the first TD since independence to be made a minister on their first day in office. This was done according to some closely involved in the teeth of fierce opposition from the older and more militantly Republican members of the party. Brown became the youngest minister in the government and it made the front page of the Irish Times, which celebrated his election as a unique feature of Irish parliamentary history. The fact that Brown was the only Trinity graduate in the cabinet was also a cause of some suspicion. And when he decided to turn a Church of Ireland training college in the Phoenix Park into a sanatorium and to relocate the college to the south side, he was accused of discriminating against Protestants. There was tension from the beginning with James Deeney, the chief medical officer, and the men clashed publicly over TB policy before the election. When asked by T.F. O'Higgins and James Dillon whether he'd any, have any difficulty working with Brown, it said that Deeney replied, that he'd work with Satan himself if it were to end TB. From the beginning, Brown understood the importance of good communications. He established a publicity section to make newspaper advertisements, booklets, leaflets, films, exhibitions, and radio talks, and also health films to be shown in schools, believing that money on communications was money well spent. As he said, the nation will reap rich dividends in the way of healthier citizens. This innovative publicity campaign to fight the spread of TB included a puppet film which dramatized the ways of avoiding infection and a short film set up in a shop to illustrate correct hygiene. These were seen as major innovations at the time. 
Brown's voice was heard frequently on the radio, and he used the medium to encourage Irish nurses in Britain to come home. Brown was a young man in a hurry, believing that he could die at any time, and he'd, that he'd only have one crack at it. Told by doctors that he'd only one or two years to live, he suffered from a relapse of TB shortly after becoming a minister. Phyllis remembers that at times in 1948 and in 1949, he was having to run the department from his bed at home, with officials bringing papers to him to sign. In volume four of the Cambridge History of Ireland, the most recent major scholarship in this period, we see a notable tribute to Noel Brown. Brian Gervin suggests that the new star of the government was the politically untested Minister for Health, Noel Brown. With determination, skill and enthusiasm, Brown pushed through ambitious and, uh, and a comprehensive programme to eradicate TB, which continued to be the major health threat to Irish families, especially those on lower incomes. Brown appointed another Trinity graduate, Dorothy Stopford Price, as the chair of the National Consultative Committee on Tuberculosis, and she used this position to advocate for a national vaccination scheme using BCG. I think looking back on this period, the credit for the successful campaign against TB can be shared between James Deeney, who had put much of the infrastructure in place for the anti-TB campaign, Dorothy Stopford Price and Brown, who implemented the strategy successfully. But I think, above all, the Selman Waxman and Merck Company, which developed streptomycin, the first antibiotic to cure TB in 1948. Brown's legend was fortunate in its timing. Brown also embarked on a massive hospital building program, and again he benefited from the work that had been put in place before he took office, and the increased revenue from the Irish sweepstakes. His energy and determination also played a vital part, and he had a map of the country in his office, with pins for everywhere a new hospital was going to be built. As part of his war against TB, he established the National Blood Transfusion Service in August 1948, something that has left a lasting legacy. But it was, of course, the mother and child scheme that created the legend of Brown standing up on his own against the world, a fearless opponent of clerical power. The reality, as many historians have shown, was, as it always is, a little more complicated. The scheme to provide a free medical service for women before, during and after childbirth, and for every child from birth up to the age of six, predated the inter-party government, and it fell to Brown to try and implement it once he was appointed to the Department of Health. Unfortunately, his political inexperience undermined his efforts, and he fell victim to various vested interests, including the powerful Irish Medical Association, which viewed it as the socialisation of medicine and a threat to their incomes and position in society. The Catholic hierarchy was also deeply opposed, seeing the legislation as anti-family, and wrote to the Taoiseach John, John A. Costello, who delayed passing the Bishop's mem memorandum onto Brown, which was surely a misjudgment and a mistake. Archbishop John Charles McQuaid, in particular, viewed the proposal as an encroachment by the state into the life of the individual and the first step towards totalitarianism. Like the Irish Medical Association, he believed the scheme should be subject to a means test. Faced with this strength of opposition, Brown's own leader, Sean McBride, refused to back him up. This fateful decision left Brown isolated and caused a permanent breach between the men and was never forgotten. As the crisis came to a head in April 1951, McBride asked Brown for his resignation, and he was forced to tender it. In his resignation speech, Brown blamed his own government colleagues rather than the Catholic Church, saying that they had unequivocally and unreservedly the views of the hierarchy on the matter. But he'd not been able to accept the manner in which this matter had been dealt with by my former colleagues in the government. A strange response, understanding the view of the hierarchy, but not accepting how he'd been treated by his own colleagues. Some of the blame for the debacle was Brown's, 
And as Brian Gervin suggests, Brown acted ineptly at times in his dealings with the hierarchy, his own colleagues, and the IMA. But Brown was a man of vision, drive, and determination. And this is what carried him to many successes, particularly in the fight against TB. There was also another side to his character, which lessened the chances of greater success. There was a tendency towards stubbornness. He was not given to compromise, and he was the holder of personal grudges. After the resignation of Brown, or after his resignation, Brown made the controversial decision to send his correspondence with cabinet colleagues and members of the Catholic hierarchy to the newspapers for publication, something which was considered to be a breach of trust by his former colleagues. The government collapsed soon after, and Brown stood as an independent and was re-elected. After his attempts to form a new political party went nowhere, he applied to join Fianna Fáil. This went against him in the election of 1954, where he was blamed for an unpopular budget and lost his seat. Popular with members for his fiery speeches, he was seen as disruptive by the party leadership and was then denied a place on the Fianna Fáil ticket in 1957, prompting his immediate resignation. He stood once more as an independent, and this time was re-elected. A year later, Brown founded a new political party named the National Progressive Democrats, which had two TDs and became a thorn in the side of de Valera's government. The party made little impact nationally, but Brown has been praised for speaking out against corporal punishment in schools, the death penalty, and advocating that more should be done for people with mental health difficulties. He was also a vocal speaker against apartheid, and he called for a progressively expanding boycott and importation of South African produce, as advocated by the ANC. Whenever South Africa came to play in Ireland, he took part in protests outside Lansdowne Road. Throughout his political career, he was a regular speaker in the College Historical Society. As Minister for Health, he spoke on the 31st of January in 1951, opposing the motion that this party deplores party politics, or rather this house deplores party politics. He returned to chair a meeting of the Society on the 11th of March, 1953, where he attacked the two-year health system. And he attended the inaugural meeting of Donald Deeney, the nephew of James Deeney, where he criticized Irish political leaders of the past, Cosgrave, de Valera, McBride, Costello, and Lamas, for putting loyalty to the Catholic Church ahead of the objective of achieving a united Ireland. On another occasion, he proposed the motion that this house would embrace a gayer culture, speaking alongside Dr. David Norris, then lecturer in the English department. Brown spoke powerfully about the destructive effects of homophobia and the many people who'd been forced to leave Ireland or face blackmail or imprisonment. Re-elected in 1961, he decided on another change in political direction and joined the Labour Party. But it didn't help him retain his seat and he lost the general election in 1965. In 1969, he won the seat back again and became a sharp opponent of the party returning into government and as a junior partner in coalition. This uncompromising position against coalition meant that he was deselected as a Labour Party candidate in 1973 when he refused to sign the party pledge supporting coalition. Throughout this time, Brown continued to work as a medical doctor and returned to Trinity to study for a diploma in psychological medicine, which he was awarded in 1966. Brown's work took him to the newly built suburb of Ballymun, where he came to believe that many mental health problems he saw were the fault of social and economic factors. In 1970, he was appointed as a senior consultant psychiatrist by the Eastern Health Board and returned to his old hospital in Newcastle, which he had reopened as a psychiatric hospital. He retired as a psychiatrist in 1977. Instead of running for the Dáil as an independent in 1973, Brown decided instead to stand for the Shannad, for the University of Dublin constituency. I think Brown found a home in the Shannad where he was able to speak freely on issues he felt strongly about, including the need to liberalise our laws on contraception and divorce, 
and he became the first member of the Oireachtas to advocate for therapeutic legal abortion. In so many ways, Brown was ahead of his time, including when it came to the treatment of women and children. Traditional views on illegitimacy were denounced from his place in the Shannad as dazzlingly inhumane, cruel and barbarous. And Brown attacked the way both the church and state treated mothers who gave birth to children outside of marriage, saying it was cruel, repressive and totally unjust that children were made to suffer. His criticism was far-reaching, blaming society and not just the state for exercising our own independent judgment to see that a child born out of wedlock is a precious and wonderful thing, a human being. Still officially a member of the Labour Party, Brown was nominated to run for the party in Artane in the 1977 general election, before the national executive rejected his nomination. Brown had fallen out with many of his former party colleagues, and some of his language was considered far too harsh. For example, comparing the Fine Gael Labour Coalition to Nazi Germany. Undaunted, he ran as an independent and was elected receiving twice as many votes as his Labour rival. Shortly after this, he was formally expelled from the Labour Party and co-founded a new party, the Socialist Labour Party. Professor David Thornley, the distinguished Trinity academic, broadcaster and politician, joined the new party purely because of Noel Brown. He said there was nobody he respected more in politics, and if it was good enough for Brown, well, it was good enough for him. However, even Thornley was sometimes confused by the conflicting positions his friend sometimes took, and once admitted that Noel has changed his mind so often that it baffles even me, who's known him for 25 years. The new political party was not a success. Brown was the party's only TD and refused to be its leader or even its parliamentary representative. Re-elected in 1981, he supported the Fine Gael Labour Coalition because of a commitment to outlaw corporate punishment in schools. Interestingly, both Fine Gael and Labour attempted to pers persuade him to stand as a candidate for, for each party in the February 1982 election. And I do wonder how he would have fared if he'd taken the decision to join my party. Gareth Fitzgerald approached him personally to stand for Fine Gael in the hope that it would deprive Fianna Fáil of a seat. Brown said he would consider the request, slept on overnight, which he did before courteously rejecting it, and then decided against standing again and retired from active politics. Living in a cottage in Connemara, Brown published his famous memoir, Against the Tide, and it became a publishing sensation, capturing the public imagination with its revealing cabinet portraits and unflinching language. However, as his great biographer, John Horgan, has recognised, there were many inaccuracies and omissions, and he's called it a better guide to feeling than to facts. In particular, his venomous description of the former Labour Party leader, William Norton, who was dead 20 years, offended many of his old colleagues and was seen as too harsh and unwarranted. As the 1990 presidential election approached, some of Brown's supporters, including Michael D. Higgins, worked to secure the nomination for the Labour Party run. Despite the backing of Labour's Women's National Council, he was overly, overwhelmingly defeated by Mary Robinson in the vote of the Parliamentary Party and Administrative Council. It's something he never forgave her for. Indeed, Brown criticised Robinson frequently during her term. For example, dismissing her candle in the window of the Aris Anuktaron in memory of the diaspora as a fatuous gesture. Towards the end of his life, he claimed that he was happy that he didn't run for president and didn't get the nomination because it was only an impotent and titular post and criticised Robinson for having squandered her undoubted talents on the roll. Brown died on the 22nd of May 1997. The obituary in The Economist described him as a doctor that tried to cure Ireland, and that, I believe, is a fitting epitaph. Throughout his career, he was fearless in fighting for what he believed was right, and I believe he should rightly be considered one of Trinity's greatest graduates. 
the obituary writer in The Economist, noted that Brown was always praised for his fearlessness in pursuit of his objectives, and thought this was an ingenious way of saying he was sometimes wrong and obstinate with it. Brown was certainly not always right, and he could be harsh and unflinching, even to friends and those close to him. But he was definitely someone who had a transformational effect on Irish politics and society, and his contribution in so many areas was positive, forward-looking, and profound. So to conclude, I want to take you back to Hollymount in County Mayo, and the plaque unveiled to honour Noel Brown's mother. Brown wrote the text of the inscription, and it contains his only summary of his own career and how he wanted it to be remembered. It reads, Mary Theresa Cooney, born 1885, died tragically London, 1927. Courageous mother of Dr. Noel Brown, deputy and minister for health, 1948 to 51. Resigned in defense of the mother and child health service, 1951. Honorary fellow, Trinity College Dublin, May 1994. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Tanishta, for that uh, really uh, thrilling. And I learned many new things about Noel Brown uh, from, um, from your discourse. Uh, and I like the phrase very much, the doctor that uh, tried to cure Ireland. Uh, it certainly needed a lot of curing at the time. Probably still needs uh, continuous uh, attention paid to it. Um, and we're... Uh, uh, here in Trinity, very proud of Noel Brown. And uh, I think you're right when you summarize him as one of Trinity's greatest uh, graduates. Interesting, of course, that he uh, became one of our greatest graduates uh, through uh, a life in, in politics and a life in um, public engagement uh, with ideas, uh, engagement with the ideas of his time, engagement with trying to bring about a better life for everyone living in, in the country. I think he was very brave, uh, and that uh, bravery uh, uh, was why he made such an impact on so many. Um, I think we can, these Trinity Monday Memorial discourses act in a way to try and uh, provide inspiration for us all in how we can, uh, through our, our education, that we receive here in this university and through the opportunities that it affords for public engagement to do better things for our country and for all who live in it. I think Noel Brown was certainly an inspiration for that and we hope that those who've been, had the opportunity here to listen to your speech, Tanishta, will see that they can do so much uh, by following the example of Noel Brown in many respects. Of course, he did seem to... Um, uh, uh, you know, make as many enemies as friends in the progress of, uh, of his uh, activities in politics. But what um, I was interested in, in your speech, Tanish, there was how often he was endorsed by his constituency, how often he went, he changed parties, created a new one, uh, went forward for election and topped the poll. This is very interesting that um, despite the fact that he would fall out with so many in his political party, uh, to such an extent that he'd have to resign his post or whatever, as soon as he put himself before the electorate again, they would elect him. This is a great uh, attribute of democracy and probably um, says a lot about him as a speaker and uh, as a person, that those who could look at him close up in his constituency uh, could see he was someone worth having in the Dáil or in the Shannon. I hadn't known, actually, until I heard you speak, that he was an honorary fellow of Trinity College. Uh, and I'm delighted that those who uh, made that decision back then uh, had the foresight to do so, and that Noel Brown himself got such um, uh, a boost and so much pleasure himself and his wife Phyllis from election uh, as an honorary fellow of Trinity College. So in conclusion, thank you very much.
uh, thank you for accepting this invitation. Thank you for giving so much thought to what you were going to say and for giving us such uh, an erudite, interesting uh, and thoughtful discourse on, indeed, a man who was one of Trinity's greatest graduates, Noel Brown. Thank you very much.